All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm apparently not a morning person, so Mark Miller decided to make me the morning speaker. <laughs> um, all right, so we have 25 minutes, and I'm going to attempt to do a maturity model discussion in 25 minutes. So it's, uh, it's going to be fast. So um, for those who got to see the keynote yesterday, there's a few things in here that might be the same. Um, some of the stuff that I pulled into this deck was basically part of the journey that we've been on to get to DevSecOps. And the idea here was to help uh, everybody in the room to be able to understand uh, what it takes to do DevSecOps from a maturity standpoint. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm really interested in building comics. I've uh, been working on founding the DevSecOps community and movement and uh, recently started up doing all day DevOps with Mark Miller and Derek Weeks and have uh, been also starting up another thing, which is Hacker Girl. So I don't have enough to do. I figured, why not take on more things? Um, Hacker Girl is something that I'm uh, very fond of, and you'll see a lot about that in the next six months. So why the change? Why DevSecOps? Why wasn't DevOps enough? Um, why something else? Well, we know that the cloud kind of started taking over and moving us from compute to cloud. Uh, the idea here is we started looking at that from a traditional security perspective. I remember kind of getting pushed off my rock a long, long time ago um, because I worked for companies that were pretty progressive. One of the progressive companies I worked for was Sony, and they were basically trying to figure out how to do agile, and then all of a sudden security became a big thing. Um, as I start to look at what it took to do those things, we realize very quickly traditional security was becoming old and sort of busted and checklists weren't working. And so the idea was, all right, well, something's happening. There's all this new forward movement. We're starting to hear things like rugged. We're starting to hear things like agile security and SSDLC, vSIM, building security in. Um, and so, you know, all of those things start, started to create this dimension and pressure to be able to move faster. DevOps want to be able to publish software at the speed of light. Um, and so all of that pressure has really culminated in how the heck do we, do we move faster? Well, it probably means we're going to have to code too. I'm a security professional that grew up developing code first. And so my skill set immediately became impactful about 15 years ago when I started doing utility computing at a um, data center. So I just want to kind of set the groundwork because it's going to go fast now. So first things first, your mind share. We put up a manifesto because whenever you want to do something big, you put up a manifesto. That's just how it works. Um, the idea here is bust your code. If I put it into a few simple terms, it's bust your own code before the bad guys do. And um, there's a lot of different things that you can say about this. There's a lot of different um, things we could have put into this. We could have made it so that developers were thought about a little bit more forward looking. We could have put ops in here a little bit more. But what we really focused on was we got to get security professionals to move and change. And so that has to resonate with them. So how hard could it be? Well, security tech hasn't really caught up. I mean, most of my job was made gooey about 15 years ago. You got onto a firewall and there was like these little clicky buttons. Instead of looking at the config, it just was too hard for a security professional who was trying to do regulatory stuff as well. And so all the technology kind of followed suit. APIs are really horrible in most security tech. You actually have to hack most security products to make them work and it's kind of crappy. So, damn, it's going to be a hard journey, right? Um, security technology, three years after starting this journey, has gotten way better than it was, uh, admittedly, but everything has been sort of a slug every day. So in the beginning, because we're going to do maturity model, right, we got to have five things. we got to move up our little pillars. Uh, you're going to see this slide progress. So at level one, you're really thinking about, how do I get rid of my checklist? There's going to be a lot of friction. Everybody's going to tell you how much they love you. No, not really. They're going to tell you how much they hate you. They're going to tell you how much you're a roadblock. They're going to tell you how much you need to figure out how to not be a dinosaur. I'm starting to feel like you might have heard this or you are hearing it. So, yeah, it's kind of an awful journey at the beginning. Um, 
And then it kind of gets interesting because you realize that your only out is red teaming. And I mean that sincerely. Like your only out is to go start breaking into everything and saying, hey, I broke it and I broke your other thing and all that perfect security that we bought into, all the compliance that we said we were doing and all the things that we were measuring and we said we were gonna get to continuous security. Yeah, it's not working. And by the way, we actually have to get the mind share of developers very quickly. So the only way to get the mind share of a developer is to break their code as quickly as possible. So you lose faith in your traditional security. This is all level one, by the way, right? You're crying, your CISO's happy because he's got his little checklist, he's got the thing where his PowerPoint's working, his measurements are all happy, his board reports are great, right? Yeah, but everybody else hates it. Your customers hate the security they're getting. Your developers hate the security they're building, if they're building it. And um, every time they turn around, they're being told no. No, your stuff does not fit in our data center the right way. No, your stuff isn't going to be able to be pushed every five seconds. No, your stuff, I'm sorry, it just doesn't fit here, so you're gonna have to go to another company that's more progressive. Starting to feel also pretty similar. So what are the changes, right? We started out basically experimenting. All right, checklists don't work, crap. We're gonna figure out how to code. Taking security professionals and asking them to code is really kind of interesting, especially when they don't want to, aren't interested, and can tell you every reason in the book why it's not useful. Um, so if you can imagine, that's kind of what you get started with. This is a really interesting journey from there on out. Uh, security operations are like, what are APIs? Why do I have to care? Microservices, huh? I have a firewall, I have a dimension, I have a grid. I don't have to worry about anything else. The hackers are coming in one way and one way only. Um, and now it's basically, yeah, they're coming in every way because everything's integrated. There's all these components and compliance operations. I went to our compliance partner and basically said, your checklist, I'm not gonna fill it out anymore. Here's a bunch of stuff. It's all yours. Have, have a good time. It's like 5,000 pages worth of stuff. We made it so that all of our code's gonna just dump this into a bucket for you. And they were like, what's a bucket? Ah! Uh, science. So we were trying to figure out, how do you explain something to a developer so that they want to do it? All of a sudden you realize, oh, it's got to be scienced. We're of course going to have to figure out how to explain something with data so that a developer can actually prioritize it and make it useful. Awesome. And that's kind of how you got started with DevSecOps. How did you really want to change the world and all of the things that you're going to do? These were the basic four experiments that we did to try and convince ourselves that we didn't need to change. We didn't do these experiments to change. We did these experiments to prove we didn't need to change. Attempting to use the cloud. Um, okay, so remember all those folks that didn't want to code, didn't think it was useful, we told them all of your security tools need to be moved to the cloud. And they were like, you're kidding, right? Everything's on an appliance. It gets like put into a data center. We even had a conversation with one of our cloud providers and we said, can you, um, can you upload our, our appliance to your data center? Can we just ship it to you and you can just plug it in for us? And they laughed at us. They were like, no, 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 no. We don't do appliances. We're not a data center. We're not a hosting provider. We have this really cool software-defined interface. Like, we'll translate all of that functionality for you into the cloud. And we're like, wait a minute. Your cloud's supposed to be secure. You're bolting on? What the heck's going on here, right? And so, there were a lot of questions, and as you can imagine, um, security professionals who don't code, who are trying to do big data, it's kind of messy. This is level one, by the way. They say, you know, hey, it's going to be chaotic. It's really chaotic. So where do you start first? Your scanners, they're the first thing to go, because basically runtime scanning in cloud is kind of crappy too. Um, opening up ports and uh, security groups so that your scanner can go from one account to another it's just like basically opening up all of the holes for the hackers to be able to leverage to. Awesome, because by the way, when you move your scanners into the cloud, they're ephemeral IPs, unless they're static IPs, which in most cases they're not because you have to restack all the time because that's kind of the rules of the engagement. Uh, so this was really, 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 really messy. And then, whoa, how do you communicate this? We're starting to measure things. Oh my gosh, there's a full stack hack. Everybody's like, what's a full stack? Oh no, oh no, we're starting to speak another language. We're like on some Mars planet. And we started out, and a lot of these numbers that have hours behind them had months behind them when we got started. 
no one out there was a hacker who understood the cloud until they actually felt, felt like they wanted to, and then $20 got them a whole bunch of skills we didn't have. 20 bucks can get you the skills we didn't have. All right, so we're gonna have to be calm now. We're gonna have to manage everything, right? Lock it all down. So level two, you're trying to figure out how to take all that really chaotic stuff and all those experiments that proved you have to now change because they didn't prove you didn't have to change, they now become part of, well, what are we gonna do with this? How do we actually build a strategy and a roadmap to be able to move forward? How do we improve our skills? Upskilling, right? Everybody's now doing upskilled, I'm sure. We're upskilling ourselves instead of just training ourselves. We're actually trying to get as many skills as possible. So what is DevSecOps became really useful because when we started talking to ourselves about what DevOps was, we realized there was really no def definition. So with DevSecOps, there had to be a definition because that's just how security people work, is we like definitions, we like standards, we really have to cling on to our checklist, right? We're trying to put a little bit more of that back into the world. And I was like, okay, that just doesn't make sense. Why are you trying to bring me your checklist again? Ah, you're trying to fight those antibodies constantly at level two. Assembling a baseline and a roadmap. Well, if we're gonna change, then we have to take all of those appliances, which by the way was like lots of lots of equipment, and take all their data and figure out how to either move it into the cloud, convince vendors that they needed to create VMs of some sort, um, or they had to create APIs or services, or we had to find a new uh, company to be able to work with. All that stuff had to also be funneled. And security professionals don't really think in funnels either. They think in different functionality, lots of complexity. I have to log into this device and log into that device and log into this other thing to determine if something bad happened. And so that's their whole day, is literally logging in from one UI to another and they've got 75 windows open and I'm not sure how they determine anything is wrong because I've tried that before and it's really, really ugly and very stupid. Um, and I did say the word stupid and I don't usually use that, but it's kind of not a good thing from the standpoint of trying to open that many windows and figure out whether an adversary is gonna get you. And I'll tell you that correlation became really interesting at that point. Correlation starts to become something that in level two you're just absolutely married to. Case management. Oh, here was the other part. We realized that we were speaking another language and we were speaking this developer language and we had to get backlogs. And so all of a sudden we were like, you know, Jira's kind of our best friend. We moved into Jira and everybody's like, whoa, the security team just moved into Jira. Oh God, we need to leave. And all of a sudden we became developers too. And it was a weird, weird place. So we realized that we liked our work in a backlog and then we realized that everybody else liked their work in a backlog and security stuff was, that we were finding was actually work for everybody else. So we realized that we needed to actually funnel our stuff into their stuff and that's when it got really complicated. We actually started sending tickets to backlogs like we could just do that and that was just not good. You're not allowed to put stuff in our backlog without talking to us. And we're like, there's like 4,500 of you and you're all assembled in these six to eight people groups. Really, we have to talk to all of you when we find a defect, which by the way, we find every few seconds, that's gonna really not scale. So the other thing we found out is we had to work 24 by seven, because all this stuff was continuous. It's all being deployed all the time. Everybody's working globally now. You've got multiple locations out there and it's going kind of crazy, right? 24 by seven was really interesting. We started to try and baseline. Where did we have to focus? Nobody wanted to support this. It was sort of the, well, is anybody in? And we're like, well, management really doesn't know what to do with it because it's moving too fast. Um, DevOps and innovation, they love it. They like to do everything except for control something because control is a bad word, it just is. Um, and then security practitioners want to control everything. They don't trust anybody. Awesome. So the only thing you can really do is that little heart that's basically purple where everybody really does struggle to be competent. It's a great place to try and get somebody to try and work together. So what skills do you need? Well, you need them all. You need dev, sec, and ops. Whether you are a developer that's trying to do some sort of development work towards your product, you need to have some security. You need to have some operations. Security engineers also have to do development and operations. And operations, they seem to get it right away. They tend to be able to start building code pretty easily. They've got infrastructure as code. Seems to be that that was like the new revolution. As soon as they were doing infrastructure as code, everybody else had to code. And that's why the security people are like, 
yeah, that's great. You can do infrastructure as code, but can you actually start putting all of the like QA stuff that I need in there so that I can stop having to do this too? And so there's all these interesting struggles that come out of this as well. We actually realized we had to build a dashboard. And building a dashboard was primary because if you're going to communicate, you're starting to communicate Devi. I say Devi. <laughs> and the reason why dashboards were interesting for us is we already kind of knew how to dashboard because we love dashboards. We love metrics. We love to tell everybody how great they're doing. Um, and I put an A up here kind of a little bit facetious because that's not really how the measurement system worked for all of the people who were providing feedback from a security perspective. There were a lot more not good grades and there were good grades at the very beginning. And when you're working with A students, everybody wants to go from an F to an A. It's a very surprising thing. So we're going to be consistent now. And this is good because I'm halfway through my deck and I just got my 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so we're worth being consistent, right? And at level three, you should be organizing. You should be starting to standardize. Is it feeling a little bit more security-like? Is it starting to get a little bit more calm? And we're going to be consistent now. And DevSecOps does have some consistencies. You are actually trying to work in workflow systems. You are trying to move back in and get some more information together. You are actually working within an SDLC type life cycle. You're actually trying to put some dimensions that help make that chaos that was once there a little bit less and become more reliable. I have heard so much from folks that were trying to understand us in the very few um, years that we actually got started that they wanted to be able to rely on us more. They were like, where are your roadmaps? What are you trying to accomplish? You don't speak like us just yet. You kind of talk like us a little bit, but we do these roadmap things. And so this was actually the part of the journey where roadmaps became really essential. We also realized that bringing standards together made, made it so we could actually do more with less. Um, and we also realized that we wanted to be inclusionary. So if you can imagine, there's a whole bunch that um, people are trying to accomplish through being different. We were like, nope, that's the same as what we need, that's the same as what we need, that's the same as what we need. Oh wait, we actually just are gonna have to map in everything because people are gonna come into our company that are gonna come from a variety of places and they're gonna start from somewhere else and they need to actually know how to follow us. So we've been mapping everything together. We leverage the kill chain to be able to create a common base and then we map in all of the different standards and capabilities that are out there so that anybody who's already been trained on something can have a place to start. And the reason why that's interesting is that we found out through threat modeling that threat modeling didn't work for us. We actually had to do attack mapping. And what we really liked is there was this product that basically allowed us to do better component parts. And so you're probably familiar with this if you've been um, hearing Sonatype talk about their product. You've seen the little green bubbly diagram before. But we also started doing something which was an experiment and we said to our developers, hey, could you actually attack your stuff and write it down? And so we kind of said, just build these bubble diagrams. So they started putting their attack maps together. And those attack maps take about 10 to 15 minutes, and they're willing to keep them up. And oh, by the way, they started doing attacks.md, and they started doing security.md, and that was kind of cool too. And we started realizing we need to look for patterns. Security degrades over time. It's amazing, but it really does degrade. Like, you don't get it perfect. You actually don't get it good enough for it to survive long term. You go from a C to an F over a period of time, and then you've got to kind of go and figure out how to get ahead of the attackers again, because they really do like to beat up your stuff and figure out how they can break it. So security does degrade. And then investing in chat ops. That's right, we security people, we like to chat ops. Um, we have a whole bunch of robots and all kinds of bots that feed into us, and we also use bots to go and look for everybody else's stuff so we can break into their code. We like to hunt chat ops, um, which is very cool because people share passwords, and that's really a bad thing, so we use that information to break into their stuff, and then they don't share their passwords anymore. So we've kind of created this ecosystem where you can actually learn something as a developer and in line when it happens. So let's be measured. Um, at maturity level four, you're going to be all about measurement. And I mean a lot about measurement. Everything is a number now. Everything's going to be a letter grade. Um, and it doesn't have to be a letter grade in your environment, but we found that it was really, really powerful and it got us out of a lot of debates and it made it super easy to have something that meant the same to everybody. Now, I will tell you that grades don't necessarily become a global thing because we actually found that out, that they didn't traverse a few regions that we were working in. We're like, oh, you guys don't use grades in your country. Okay, we'll have to figure out how to explain this. 
So there was a little bit of dimension to that, but as soon as they got used to it, it became really easy. When they saw an F, they did something about it. Um, and then we also realized that we had to talk to other companies because we weren't smart enough. In fact, we actually needed to learn from other people too because as soon as we started learning from them, we became smarter. That was really cool. And we also realized that we wanted to figure out how to build our decisions and figure out how to make our grades mean something by using code to make those grades come to life. Um, grades are kind of interesting because we actually use things like infrastructure as code to develop grades. We have checks that go out to check APIs. And all of that information culminates in good decisions. And if you don't have good decisions, we hunt those because we're a red team. So we developed benchmarks. We went out and looked for companies that were like us. I constantly try to talk to anybody who's willing. Um, and I'm like asking questions all the time and trying to get feedback for the things that I'm teaching so that I can get better and figure out how we can move things forward. Collaborating with Open Gradebook is something we're working on now, which is basically um, looking at the benchmarks we've been doing. We've been talking to other companies about how we're doing what we're doing and just trying to figure out how to share it. I just said that security people are trying to figure out how to share. That's a really interesting endeavor, if you can imagine. Security folks don't necessarily come with that DNA. Um, and so we came up with a way to actually do that. From the standpoint of grades, we've realized that we can actually use grades as a common denominator and bring people together. Inclusion is really where we believe that this thing is going to actually produce the best, most ruggedized software. When you look back on this diagram earlier on that I talked about for Wardley Maps in the very beginning of this discussion, I actually have something painted which is rugged software where customers are actually asking you for security in their software and the products that they're using every day because by the way, this is also the opportunity area. Now that everything is software, there's no barriers for hackers. And so now, as much as you may not have wanted to be a security professional, everyone in the room, everyone who's building software is now going to have to have some part of their DNA be security too. So we're going to optimize, right? The last favorite land for everybody is they do it and they do it world class. And I would tell you that I think this is the area where it's probably the murkiest because we're not sure we're doing world class yet because we don't really believe we're that good quite yet. And I would tell you that I hope that that always stays the same way, which is we always are trying to strive to be better so we don't think that we're not, that we're actually all that good at this. So at level five, you're moving people around in your groups. They have mission-based teams. They're constantly you know, optimizing the playbooks they're going through and they're um, adversary obsessed. So it's all about the bad guys, right? Adversary obsessed. Bad guys are bad. We want to get rid of them. We're simplifying. We're using the pyramid to try and do 80% security in a very short period of time. And we're looking to build playbooks. There are tons of playbooks that we've got. We've been trying to figure out how to distribute them. We're actually revising all of the DevSecOps website. And we're moving things forward. So I would tell you that if you got something out of this in the short format that I had, find a way to provide feedback so it can get better because this is new content. And by the way, it will change over time because I'm going to get feedback every time I tell the story. And I'm hoping that at some point you're going to ask for more details so that we can figure out how to make this deck better for everybody. And if you like all of this stuff, you should join the community because we need more people like you to make things better. And finally, I really do believe in leaning in. I think it's the only way forward. And I believe that a lot of what we need to do is, um, and I've invested in Hacker Girl for this reason, we need to bring more people to this cause. So thank you to our sponsors. Join our community, and I appreciate all of your time this morning. Thank you. <laughs>